Posh Attic. Thank Liz once again for inviting me. I'd like to mention the fact that this is the uh, third year in a row that I've had the first in the Sunday morning slot uh, and, uh, with a request that perhaps I'd be moved somewhere else, but I probably won't get invited again for saying that. But uh, I am absolutely thrilled to be here. Uh, I enjoyed the do very much last night, in fact a little bit too much as you'll probably see in this act here. Um, but uh, anyway, here we go. Uh, that's who I am, that's what I'm talking about, and that's where we are today, just, just to remind me. Um, I, when I got the title Environment and Medication, I thought, ah, this is great, I can talk about whatever I like. But when you come to it, it is such a big topic that I really had difficulty in selecting what to put into this talk and what to omit. So it's, it, it is not a beginning and an ending. It's a lot of thoughts which I hope will fit in with Liz's idea of bringing things together a little bit at the end. So a lot of it is in principle uh, putting things into context rather than anything else. The first thing I do want to point out, I'm putting some bits that have been missed out, I think, a little bit by other speakers as well. The incidence of autism, this paper seems to have been totally ignored, although it was in The Lancet, which is a fairly prestigious journal and was conducted by Great Ormond Street and Guy's Hospital in London, the most prestigious children's hospitals. They did an in, uh, incidence report from the UK, from the area of London, and came up with a figure of 1 in 86 children. That was two years ago. And the two interesting features about this one is that they'd done the same group when the children were aged five, and got an instance of 1 in 166. They went back again to the same group when they're aged 10, and the figure has gone up dramatically because they'd missed out a lot of the people the first time. The people from the ethnic minority groups and the lower socio-economic groups would be missed out. So I strongly suspect that a lot of the figures you're getting here are, if anything, an underestimate rather than an overestimate of the numbers. I think it probably is more than they say. But when I were a boy, my, when my son was diagnosed, they were talking in 4 in 10,000, and now they're talking 116 in 10,000, which either there are more people about, or they were so stupid they missed 97% of the cases in the past. Now, we know the boards have been extended, but I suggest that is uh, stretching credulity a little bit too far. Another feature they refer to in this paper, the boy-girl ratio of 8 to 1 is what they got in this study. And I believe that's true because that is what we were getting but didn't like to shout it out loud. We thought we must have a skewed sample. But that is the numbers coming out. They haven't commented on that. They just reported this figure of 8 to 1. But even if we're talking 4 to 1, 1 in 86 children means 1 in 50 boys. And I actually think that that is a terrifying figure. And I also think we would have noticed it if they'd always been there in the past. I think this does support the notion that it is a, a, a big new phenomenon. And this does not include people with ADHD and dyslexia and dyspraxia. And if you don't know what dyspraxia is, just remember Kenny Bock dancing last night on the floor <laughs> and you'll get a pretty good idea of what dyspraxia does to a, an individual. So the male-female ratios I want to mention as well. So classically they said three or four to one. Now they're talking 7 to 8 to 1. But if you go to other parts, there's a paper in the last issue of Journal of Autism Developmental Disorders from Iran, 1 to 1. Equal numbers of boys and girls they're getting there. Uh, and it seems to me an OK paper. They've used a, appropriate diagnostic criteria. What does that mean? Is it some ethnic uh, difference in terms of social uh, identification? I don't know. But these things are strange. Um, and in areas of northern Canada, I understand that there are no males being born, only girls being born, because the toxins spreading up by Gulf streams and things and up to that area, very heavily polluted, and the males are more susceptible to being killed by these things. And so, they, so they just, only girls are being born there, which means there's scope for men of proven ability and discretion to move to that area, perhaps, in due course. <coughs> 
and allegedly there's a great increase in left-handedness in the UK over the last 20 years. It may just be that in the past people, they tied their left hand behind their back and made them work with their right hand, but maybe something else is going on as well. There's all these strange little things which are difficult, which are liable to interpretation in various ways, but we've got to monitor them. Another point is, even if the numbers remain the same, even if there isn't an increase in numbers, I would suggest that if they remain the same, that does indicate that environmental factors are involved, because most children with autism don't reproduce. They don't have children of their own. Some do, but on the whole they don't. So if the numbers are, going, are staying static, even that indicates environmental input. An example. With uh, skin cancer, I think we all know uh, the combination of environment and genetic factors. Uh, Light-skinned people are much more likely to get skin cancer than dark-skinned people are. So if you live in Sunderland, where I come from, and the sun rarely shines, nobody gets skin cancer, apart from those people who go to the clinics and turn a bright orange colour as a consequence. Uh, so nobody gets skin cancer. But if you move to Australia... A lot of light-skinned people do get cancer, and dark-skinned people don't. So there's a classic example of genetic fragility and environmental triggers. I tried to think of some diseases that were not like that. I couldn't think of any. I couldn't think of any diseases which are totally genetic, apart perhaps from Huntington's career, but even that is doubtful, and Down syndrome. Uh, but apart from that, I couldn't think of any disorders which are totally genetic. And I couldn't think of any disorders which are totally environmental either, apart from falling under a bus drunk. But there again, if, you're like, if you have my genes, you're more likely to get drunk than other people. So again, there's a genetic element. I think all disorders, there's a combination of genetic fragility and environmental factors. But we've always concentrated on the genetic element, and 85 90% of all the research money has gone into genetics and nothing to balance it with this side. I would suggest this is the more likely area to find some solutions. And I've done this over and over again, so I'm not going to bother with this, but just to show that fragility is a normal distribution curve in that way. And if the environment changes, more people come into the at-risk category than uh, were there before. And so we get increases in all sorts of disorders. Human beings evolve near the sea. We may have first appeared in the Rift Valley of Africa, but we then migrated round the coasts and then eventually moved inland. And as we moved inland, apparently our brains got smaller. Think Kansas. Uh, as, and <laughs> and uh, this is largely because of the diet. The, the diet... Oh, hello, Kenny. Didn't see you there. <laughs> Dr. Boxer, were you here for the beginning? Oh, that's a shame. That's a shame. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, humans evolved near the sea, and so there as we moved inland, we got deficits of things which were naturally available in the, in the maritime diet. And these are things which are important to us and which we suffer deficiencies of nowadays. Commonly, iodine, selenium, I'm going to bang on about selenium as you go on through here, and zinc, very common in shellfish. The fish oils, as you know, the omega-3, omega-6 ratios uh, attract a lot of attention nowadays, and certain vitamins, A and D, and some of the B group, which are common in a, in a maritime diet. But those are things which we are genetically equipped for. We have to take these things in the form of food, but we're not doing so nowadays. Uh, and that is part of the problem. We're not eating what we are genetically equipped to do.